Um, thanks very much. So I guess over the last few days, you've been working out how to develop trials, how to design them, how to implement and, and uh, analyze them. But a really key point, uh, component of conducting um, a trial of uh, uh, any intervention, but particularly vaccines, which are clearly implemented in an otherwise healthy uh, population, is safeguarding the interests of the study participants themselves and also ensuring the integrity and the validity of the data um, that's uh, generated. And so in addition to um, my day job, which is uh, studying particularly mucosal pathogens and, and uh, preventing them with the vaccines, I've been involved in a number of uh, data uh, safety monitoring uh, boards, and I'm going to talk uh, um, about uh, um, their sort of purpose and then give you some examples of some of the decisions that we've had to make as part of those boards. So the goals of this session is to talk about what a DSMB is and how it's constituted, what it does, um, the role of a DSMB in a pandemic or an emergency response, and that was definitely experienced by DSMBs in uh, um, uh, huge, huge uh, amounts during the COVID-19 pandemic, and some examples of these sort of um, uh, DSMB uh, dilemmas. And I think one of the things you need to bear in mind is that in the sort of 1960s and uh, late 1970s, there were a number of uh, committees that met and, um, uh, um, uh, and recommended the use of DSMBs. And the question is, in the intervening uh, years, have we come, become far enough? Or is there more to do in terms of improving um, uh, the delivery of uh, safety uh, monitoring and uh, scrutiny of trials through DSMBs? So DSMBs are variously named as DSMBs or DSMCs. The critical thing is they are independent and they are representative. Um, I don't mean just in terms of different expertise, but also in terms of geography, particularly for multinational trials. They should include a studied uh, um, uh, uh, statistician and they may include ethicists and also community uh, members. And it's important to recognise that they advise the investigators and sponsors on everything from phase one through to phase three um, uh, trials. DSMB members are part of the committee um, uh, in an individual capacity. They don't represent their uh, host institutions and their work is governed by a charter. And it's important that every DSMB um, has a charter but also critical that it doesn't become legalistic. It's not a legal document, it's a guidance document as to how um, the DSMB um, operates. Some DSMBs operate a system of per diems or honoraria. I personally have never received per diems or honoraria, but actually I can see the role of those particularly to enable people from uh, um, uh, impoverished backgrounds to actually participate in DSMBs and give up their time, which can be extremely time-consuming. So I think there is a role for for payment in certain situations. And also it's important to identify uh, uh, um, mechanisms for indemnification of DSMB members, you know, clearly should there be um, uh, uh, any comeback from the decisions that are made as part of their um, uh, uh, work. At the moment, for most DSMBs, there are no formal training requirements, and, and I think that is um, uh, something that needs to be addressed over the coming years. Often people are sort of parachuted into a position, but actually have never done it uh, before. And I think increasingly um, there will be requirements for training, and, and uh, I understand that NIH does provide training for its DSMB um, members. So the primary responsibility of a, a DSMB is to regularly review unblinded data. Now, some DSMBs mask that data, so they're not, so they are semi-blinded, but they can unblind at any time. But the DSMBs that I'm on, I, I would prefer to be unblinded throughout. They look at participant safety data, the study conduct and progress, and where appropriate, both imaginicity and uh, efficacy, although obviously not all trials uh, measure these uh, parameters, sorry. Um, uh, they make recommendations about the continuation, the modification or the termination of a trial. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And they also consider um, other study-specific data, the publications that arise from the trial, data from other trials. And that's really important because often concurrently there are, uh, there's other trial data that may inform their safety decisions. And new knowledge about the disease, the vaccines and the participant uh, populations. Um, the format for a DSMB is that they are usually regular meetings, but you may have to have 
ad hoc meetings should uh, particular circumstances occur and consist of closed sessions and open sessions. I prefer to have a closed session, uh, sorry, an open session and then um, a closed session. But uh, some SMBs have an initial closed session, then an open session, then a closed session again. I don't think it really matters. But the important thing to point out is the open sessions contain a whole series of different individuals who contribute to the trial, the investigators, sponsors, coordinators and other representatives, sometimes with ad hoc domain uh, specialists, whereas the closed sessions um, consist of purely the DSMB, and then an unblinded trend, uh, um, statistician or statisticians. Um, historically, they occurred in person, but I think actually virtual meetings are very enabling because they allow individuals to participate from across the world, and it means you don't have to give up so much time in terms of travelling and so forth, and, and definitely facilitate ad hoc uh, meetings, typically occurring between one and four times a year, depending on the size of the trial and the complexity of the trial. I think critical to a DSMB, and I've been both a chair and, and a recipient of excellent chairing, is that it's crucial that the chair is strong, has good diplomatic skills, and the ability to bring in all members of the DSMB into the discussion around the uh, trial material, and is able to be both consultative, as I mentioned, but also consistent. And within the trial, it's important that it's transparent. So, um, uh, you know, the processes need to be well um, uh, organised. The sort of standing agenda items that you'd have in a DSMB meeting is to make sure that you've got the appropriate versions of your, of your chart or your protocol and your investigator brochure. You may think that sounds quite trivial, but I've been frequently at DSMB meetings where you turn around and say, hang on a minute, has this protocol changed? And actually you've not been informed of the later, latest protocol change. So it's really important to check on these as you start. To declare any conflicts of interest within the DSMB, and these, these may change um, uh, over time. Um, uh, to receive an overview from either principal or chief investigator to give you the sort of context of what's been happening, um, and then to consider the open and closed reports in the various uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, parts of the DSMB meeting, which are prepared by the study uh, statistician, and any other relevant information, for example, um, manuscripts that have been generated uh, um, from the trial. Sorry. <clears throat> Um, it's really critical that the reports provided to the DSMB are clear. And I've been on a number of DSMBs where we are inundated with line by line of information that's ind indecipherable. And so it's important that DSMBs are very uh, firm in the format and the way in which they are presented data. So they're able to see the, um, the data clearly and identify potential uh, safety signals. Decision making needs to be very clear. You need to have a specified quorum within the uh, um, uh, uh, within the charter, typically uh, at least three people. Certainly as a chair, I try to arrive at consensus and extremely rarely if we've had to um, resort to voting in terms of decision making. It's much better to be able to arrive at a consensus. The DSMB makes uh, recommendations primarily to continue the trial, potentially to recommend uh, um, uh, amendments or to stop or to suggest uh, additional changes uh, to the trial. The DSMB may ask for clarifications. There need to be clear minutes uh, uh, to document those decisions. And it's really important that communication with the DSMB goes through the chair. So there are not multiple channels of information going in different directions. So communication with the, with the chair, except obviously I'm transmitting documents for DSMB meetings, needs to be through the chair, not through the individual DSMB uh, members. Um, specific areas of review that I find particularly useful is that I think the DSMB needs to have sight of the statistical analysis plan. Often investigators are quite reluctant to generate it and to, and to provide it to the DSMB, but I'm really insistent that this is provided at an early stage so we can actually see what's going on and to see their, their, their plan for, for analysis. Um, the DSMB needs to provide good oversight of trial integrity in terms of data quality, the recruitment and retention, and particularly the representativeness of the trial. Are they recruiting enough uh, people uh, from a female gender? Um, are they recruiting pregnant women, if, if appropriate, people from minorities, people with disabilities? Oftentimes, people recruit from the easiest populations, but it's important to make sure that what's being generated is representative. Obviously, we need to see oversight of adherence to the, the protocol and the performance of individual centres so that um, 
uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the trial data is representative. And um, really to emphasize the importance of confidentiality, and I'll sort of come back to that when I talk about emergency uh, um, uh, um, uh, vaccine trials in the context of emergencies, where confidentiality is really important to uh, maintain, and there's a real um, uh, um, uh, danger of, of information leaking out that's inappropriate or incorrect. And also to make sure that there's a clear overview of when there are going to be interim analyses and that inter, in the additional interim, in, interim analyses don't sneak into uh, the trial process. And that's why a clear statistical analysis plan is so important. Um, clearly, the DSMB big focus is looking at adverse events. And you, you'll be talking about these or have talked about these in great detail, so I'm not going to explain them uh, in any sense. Um, uh, at each DSMB meeting, you're presented with uh, um, uh, a summary and the line listings for all of the adverse events. But severe adverse events, severe unexpected serious adverse events, and where appropriate um, uh, adverse events of special uh, uh, interest are reported to the DSMB at the earliest opportunity. And then a decision is made as to whether um, uh, there is a requirement for an ad hoc uh, meeting. The other areas that are important is, is really understand the impact of the vaccine. Is it immunogenic? Is it uh, efficacious? And that data needs to be fed to the DSMB um, uh, as well. So given that this is a lecture not far after lunch, I just want to make sure that you're all still with me. Um, so a little quiz. Um, we're going to just use hands for this bit, but we're going to get a bit more technical later on. These are yes or no answers. So you can't sit in the middle. There's no sitting on the fence. So the first question, please raise your hand if um, uh, DSMB recommendations are binding to the sponsor. If it's yes, raise your hand. Are DSMB re recommendations binding for the sponsor? Yes or no? If it's yes, raise your hand. So the answer is no. DSMB uh, recommendations are not binding to the sponsor. I'll come back to you in a moment. Um, DSMB can stop a study, yes or no? Yes. No, the DSMB cannot stop a study. Um, I'll come back to you in a moment. Can, can a DSMB change the study design, yes or no? Raise your hand. No. Does the DSMB communicate directly with the competent regulatory authorities? So do we talk to ethics committees, uh, to regulatory committees? If it's a yes, raise your hand. No. Should investigators and trial participants be informed about the outcome of DSMB meetings? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> so I think the important thing to recognise is that DSMBs are set up in an advisory capacity. I think it would be extraordinary for investigators, though it, it, it does happen, to ignore the recommendations of a DSMB. But a DSMB can make recommendations, but they are not binding to the sponsor or the investigators. A DSMB can recommend that a study stops, but the decision is that of the principal investigators and the chief investigators, and indeed potentially the, the, the sponsors, but not the DSMB can't, can't absolutely insist. We frequently, as DSMB members, recommend changes to, to protocols or, or, or clarifications of protocols, but they can't actually change the protocol. That is up to the investigators. Um, DSMB shouldn't be having a direct dialogue with regulatory authorities, but oftentimes questions are posed to the DSMB through the study investigators, and that is that is perfectly valid. It can become an extreme pressure and something that you have to push back against sometimes, particularly when there's a request to unblind studies when we don't think it's appropriate, and that, that happens uh, not infrequently. But there shouldn't be direct communication. And clearly... The SMB needs to communicate with its investigators, providing a clear letter setting out its recommendations, requests for clarifications, uh, and so forth. And I think something that's not done enough is that the trial participants should be aware of what the DSMB uh, um, thinks. Okay, so in terms of stopping or holding a trial, so temporarily stopping um, a trial, the rationale for doing it is clearly if there is a safety signal that means that actually you need, either need to scrutinise the data further or actually um, stop the trial, particularly when the risks outweigh the benefits. Remembering that this is a healthy population that we're studying, and so it's really important that the, risks out, uh, the, the benefits outweigh the risks. 
um, you may stop a trial in terms of futility. So your trial statistician may tell you, even if you ad, um, uh, accumulate more participants, you're not going to see a change, and this this uh, vaccine is not going to be uh, uh, efficacious. And so, therefore, it's not reasonable to continue to recruit to a trial. Uh, and the flip side is, is that there may be such a strong signal that of efficacy that um, um, you may uh, um, um, wish to recommend uh, stopping the trial. However, my personal view of this is wherever possible, you should, you should complete a, a trial to its to its completion, recruit all the participants, because um, it enables you to gather all of the safety data that you really need to really see the efficacy over time. There is potentially the, the possibility that actually over a very short period of time, the a vaccine may be effective, but actually, you know, for example, over the year or two years that the trial was originally uh, um, uh, planned to do, effort, efficacy uh, uh, doesn't completely hold. Um, clearly, if there's new external evidence from other trials or other evidence about uh, the disease, that may uh, lead you to a hold or can uh, um, stop the trial. And obviously, if the t- trial is not being conducted appropriately, the DSNB may recommend stopping the trial. And oftentimes in protocols, particularly in early phase studies, there are clear holding or stopping uh, rules. Um, It's important to recognize the impact of stopping or holding a trial. Obviously, as I mentioned, it, it impacts on the opportunity to deliver a definitive result. If you stop a trial, you may not get the full result that you're looking for. It, um, stopping a trial may affect your uh, um, opportunity to see the durability of beneficial effects or uh, really see the, the, the more later harmful effects. Um, but obviously, it may have benefits for the, the population, because if you're in a situation where there is a pandemic, for example, access to a vaccine early is going to be um, really important. It will impact on current and prospective trial pa- participants in terms of access to the vaccine, but also exposure to vaccine uh, um, effects. And um, clearly, if you go around stopping every trial just because of a slight safety signal, um, that's going to have um, an effect on the conduct and perception of trials in the future. So this all needs to be balanced extremely carefully. The last um, bit in, in this part of the talk that I just want to touch on is a reporting of DSMBs in trial publications report. And I think it is really um, uh, uh, um frankly mortifying that generally DSMBs are not reported well within trial popula- um, uh, publications. So this was a systematic review conducted in 2014, and actually only about 60% of these uh, trials mentioned that there was a DSMB uh, involved, and only 20% listed the names of DSMB um, uh, members. I feel strongly that um, uh, um, within reporting of trials that have a DSMB, the names of the affiliations of DSMB members need to be available, perhaps in supplementary information, but that needs to be available to reassure people that it's been adequately scrutinized. They need to recall the frequency of DSMB meetings. The DSMB charter needs to be available. And ideally, the DSMB recommendations that significantly modify the protocol or the course of the trial need to be included somewhere within the trial um, materials. And that really is somewhere, I think, the direction of travel that we need to go on in terms of um, uh, uh, the proper reporting of vaccine trials, or indeed all trials. So what about um, uh, being on a DSMB during a pandemic, during a worldwide emergency? I was fortunate enough, or probably stupid enough, um, to be uh, uh, part of the DSMB that oversaw all of the va- uh, the Oxford Astra- AstraZeneca uh, vaccine trials uh, across the world, except in the United uh, States. Um, I was fortunate enough to co-chair uh, this DSMB with Chris Chu, who will be talking later on for part of uh, this process. I think we both aged considerably um, uh, during this process. I think you will remember the intense scrutiny, both from the news, but also from uh, the scientific community of all of the vaccine trials, and the really quite unhelpful intervention of CEOs and companies who provided bits of information, false information, um, or just wanted to talk about their vaccines during the conduct of these really pivotal and really important trials that were important in a public health uh, emergency. And if that wasn't bad enough, you had the politicians weighing in, wanting to demonstrate that they were part of the process of, of, of these trials, commenting on the trials, potentially even wanting to release early information about this. And clearly, 
providing pressure on uh, our trial investigators to get their results out as early um, as, uh, as possible. So in amongst this mayhem, what is really critical is that a DSMB should continue to operate as it's always operated, which means that it needs to safeguard the interests of its participants and it needs to assure the trial integrity and validity. Clearly, there's a time pressure, but it's important not to cut uh, uh, corners. Um, the challenge is, um, as being part of a DSMB or chairing a DSMB in, in this context, was that clearly this was a public health emergency. And there were real uh, perceptions of vaccines and their, and their safety emerging um, uh, uh, over uh, uh, time. We had frequent ad hoc meetings, often in the middle of the night or at weekends, to um, look at uh, 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 safety signals and trial information. And we were under intense pressure because the impact of our decisions were really important. If we stopped a trial, that would mean that people may be denied an important vaccine. If we stop, if we didn't stop a trial, then people may be exposed to adverse events. So it's a, it was a real dilemma having to be done at speed, um, uh, having to deal with large volumes of data from multiple trials. At one stage, we were overseeing nine different trials and trying to retain the different protocols from these nine different trials from, from across the world. Um, was really quite a, um, a challenge, particularly as there were real differences between the protocols. Um, these vaccines were trialled in high adverse event populations, in older people, for example, who in the background already have a high rate of adverse um, events because of their multi-morbidities. Uh, uh, confidentiality was really important. We really had to emphasise this and actually had to ban certain attendees from the DSMB meetings because it was clear that they couldn't uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, prevent themselves from uh, talking about these uh, 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 trials. Um, and as I mentioned, there were regular demands from regulatory authorities and indeed from politicians for information about data. And we had to resist this or at least modify how data was provided so that we didn't prejudice the integrity of trials. So um, I, I've got a few minutes uh, uh, left, and so I've got a couple of case studies that I just want to uh, uh, go through to sort of really demonstrate the difficulties of decision-making that we make. So the first uh, study was one of the first SMBs that I was involved in, not of a vaccine, but actually of an intervention uh, in critically ill children. Um, uh, going back to the late 1980s and 1990s uh, 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 through to the 2000s, there was a big push amongst paediatricians um, to, uh, uh, in the management of uh, children with shock, to use large uh, volume fluid management. And um, around that time, Kath Maitland, who was based in Kenya at the time, decided that what we needed was strong trial evidence to support the use of fluid management in critically ill uh, um, uh, children, and to work out in particular whether to give saline or to give albumin was the best um, uh, uh, treatment. So this was the so-called PEACE trial, which was reported in the New England Journal. There's also a, a publication by Jim Todd, which talks about the work of the DSMV within this trial. So in one component of the trial, children with a febrile illness and hypoperfusion were randomised to either receive saline or um, albumin. The volumes were changed during the protocol, but that doesn't really matter compared to a control, which was just basic maintenance fluids. So for those of you who aren't clinicians, typically um, maintenance fluids is what the body normally needs. Um, uh, people were given extra fluid either as a salt solution or as an albumin uh, uh, solution. And the primary comparisons were saline versus the, uh, uh, the, the control arms, albumin versus the uh, um, uh, uh, saline arm. And the idea was to recruit nearly 4,000 uh, children. So this is the table of the data um, uh, uh, um, uh, seen by the DSMB uh, uh, during the trial. Um, as you can see, uh, in June of 2009, when they recruited about 400 uh, uh, children, uh, this is the mortality in each arm. This is a comparison between mortality at 48 hours between the different uh, uh, arms, albumin, saline, uh, control. You can see here the mortality was around 8.8% uh, .8 in albumin, 10% in saline, uh, um, uh, uh, in the control arm, uh, slightly higher. So you might think that this and be, oh, actually, these seem to be working. They seem to be better control. Um, um, uh, should we stop at this stage? We decided that you know, this was early on in the trial, we should just see what goes on. There wasn't a statistical difference between uh, uh, the arms, so let's uh, go on. 
So in October, we reviewed the data again. And interestingly, now with double the number of participants, the mortality was now pretty equivalent across the arms, though still slightly higher in the control arm. So we decided uh, um, to continue. In January, um, uh, what was uh, starting to happen was that the mortality in the control arm was starting to drop. But again, there was no statistical difference between the arms. And so um, we recommended to the trial investigators that um, things uh, continue. In July, what we were starting to see was that the mortality in the control arm. So these are children that are just given normal um, uh, uh, um, fluids that they would normally get uh, uh, um, uh, to maintain uh, uh, their fluid balance. The mortality was starting to drop, so lower than those two, but not significantly different. And at this DSMB meeting, we decided that there wasn't a statistical significant difference, so we should go on to, to um, uh, see the outcome uh, of the trial. We then met again in January, and this time um, the mortality was around 10% in the albumin and the sailor arms, but had now dropped to 7% in the control arm, which was statistically significant. So the question is, what would you do? You're on the DSMB, what would you do? So, um, what should be done by the DSMB? Should you advise the investigators to continue the trial? Should you advise the investigators to continue the trial with increased vigilance? Should you advise the investigators to continue the trial but stop the saline arm and just carry on with the albumin? Should we pause the trial, ensure regulated authorities are notified and ask for more data? Or should we stop the trial on the basis of safety, not the database, and under, uh, unblind the trial and ensure the regulatory authorities are notified? So, um, if you pick up your phones, if you use your camera and shine them at the QR code, um, you should get a poll. And so, um, if you want to um, vote as to which you think uh, was the most appropriate uh, so I think we've got, once we get to 40, I think we've probably got enough answers here. So we're finally balanced. I'm just going to go back one. So we're finally balanced between pause the trial and ensure regulated authorities notified and ask for more data or stop the trial. So what we did was um, our trial statistician undertook an analysis and the analysis was such that it, it was felt that if we accumulated more participants, the relative differences would not change. And so we stopped the trial on the basis of safety and, well, we recommended stopping the trial, I should say, um, to the investigators and that the, the, um, uh, uh, the regulatory authorities were notified. And that's what um, uh, Kath Maitland did. The star was stopped. And this was a paradigm-shifting study which suggested that rather than massive fluid in, um, uh, resuscitation that was initially, which, which was really wide, uh, used wide, uh, very widespreadly, or used widespread, um, uh, um, actually maintenance fluids um, uh, was uh, safer in this uh, context. Okay, have I got time for one more, uh, Hannah? Have I got? Okay. Everybody else wants one more. Okay, so um, this is an a phase two, three SARS-CoV-2 vaccine trial in 20, uh, um, uh, 20. Before this trial, I had a full head of hair. I lost a lot of hair during this period. Um, so we've changed some details just to maintain anonymity and so forth, but... Um, uh, during the trial of uh, the uh, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca uh, uh, vaccine, a 49-year-old, otherwise completely well person, who'd had several episodes of COVID-19 within the family, was vaccinated with minimum reactogenicity. Ten days later, he developed um, a strange uh, sensation of numbness um, uh, in his body. He was reviewed by the site PI, it was a vague history. There were no red flags, nothing, nothing uh, 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 worrisome. And so it was reported as an unrelated adverse event. At the day 28 visit, things were improving, but had taken, he'd taken a, um, a, um, a week off work. And in the meantime, an MRI, so this is a scan of the brain, came back 
with a, a report consistent with transverse myelitis, so an inflammation of the spinal cord. And that's not been previously reported to the vaccine. Um, he was undergoing a, a lumbar puncture to look at the fluid, other lab investigations, and further review of the MRI by experts was uh, um, being undertaken. So this was reported in a urgent uh, um, uh, uh, communication between uh, the study chief investigator and myself, and then uh, uh, ultimately um, uh, led to an ad hoc DSMB meeting. So um, the question is, is if you uh, 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 are the DSMB chair, so that's uh, 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 me, what would you do? Would you advise the investigators to continue the trial with increased vigilance, warning other similar trials in case other similar events occur? Would you advise the investigators to continue the trial and arrange for the DSMB to meet and review f- with further data? Would you pause the trial to ensure, ensure regulatory authorities are um, notified and arrange an urgent DSMB meeting? Would you stop the trial on the basis of safety, not the database, unblind the trial, and ensure the, neg- the regulatory authorities are notified? Or would you arrange a trial meeting of the study, CIDSMB, Sponsor Ethics Committee, and regulatory authority to discuss um, what's happened? And this is in the middle of a pandemic. So is the answer one, two, three, four, or five? So I'll wait till we get to 40. So there's quite a, there's quite a spread, isn't there? What we wouldn't do is have a direct discussion with the Ethics Committee and regulatory authorities. That, you know, that, as I mentioned earlier on, is not something typically a DSMB um, uh, would do. It's, it's for the sponsor and the investigators to communicate with the, with the regulatory authorities. What we chose to do was because, because this was potentially, you know, if this was going to occur on multiple occasions, this it was a potentially a really important, uh, unexpected adverse event and something we need to consider very carefully. So in consultation with the chief investigator, we recommended that the trial be stopped. And you'll all remember that occurring in the news. So we recommended that the trial not was stopped, was paused. And whilst we considered the information and got expert input into um, uh, um, the, the findings uh, um, uh, from the MRI and the other um, uh, investigations that were done. And then on the basis of that, we recommended that the trial then restarted. But we held the trial to be absolutely sure that the safety of participants was, pre- was preserved. So I'm going to stop there. You've all got lots of uh, um, hands, but uh, um, uh, stop there, except to say that you will get this. But there's a whole list of um, uh, um, further reading. But I would particularly recommend there's two recent publications to come out around the um, DSMB decisions that were made in two big trials during the COVID pandemic, which I think are really yeah, useful to read. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh God, everybody wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we start? It's better than you take it. Okay, let's start from here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Uh, uh, what what type of uh, trial for which uh, you should recommend the uh, DSMB implementation? So historically, they were ten- tended to be used for late phase trials, so f- uh, phase 2B or phase 3. My strong feeling is they should be used for all trials, um, including phase 1. Phase 1 trials are quite resistant to having DSMBs because they feel a small number of patients, they know what they're doing. But I think you need external oversight for all um, uh, investigation trials. Obviously not for phase four trials, which are post licensure, um, uh, surveillance essentially, but for phase one, two, and three trials should all have a DSMB is, is my view. Shall we go line by line here so that we take from the very end? Yes. Thank you. Just in terms of, I had a question in terms of the process assessment of the DSMB. Uh, do you, I mean, in terms of how do you really diagnose in terms of if, if it's a signal or an event, right, to come to a serious AEFA, how do you do the process? 
So you're, I think you're highlighting one of the big challenges for a DSMV. And um, one of the problems is that DSMVs often face one-off events. So a one-off ep- episode of epilepsy or a one-off episode of um, a transverse myelitis. And how do you interpret that one-off um, uh, episode? Somebody once called these, one, to me, called these onesies, which in the UK are actually a, a full suit pyjama. Um, but, but, you know, these are one-off events. And I think, you know, as we did with the transverse myelitis, if this is a really unexpected event, you need to make sure you've got all of that expert opinion to make, um, you know, the, the appropriate decision as to whether this, you know, could just have occurred by chance. And, you know, obviously transverse myelitis occurs in the general population. Um, or actually, could this be vaccine related? And so for the um, for the uh, Oxford uh, vaccine trials, to their credit, they actually gathered specialist committees to look at neurological events and hematological um, events to inform the SMBs ab- uh, um, uh, uh, about this. So I think you have to scrutinise these very carefully. Clearly, once you, you start to accumulate multiple events, then that's important. And that really also communicates the importance of, of communication between DSMVs. So we were in quite close communication with um, the uh, US DSMVs for the same vaccines so that we would um, hear about similar events occurring in other parts of the world too. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about sort of accumulating the evidence together. Okay, okay, the next person to you. Uh, hi, thanks, Rob. Um, Divya Shah from the Wellcome Trust. Um, so you t- spoke a lot about kind of your role during the COVID-19 pandemic and the kind of challenges you faced and the pressure you were under. Um, yesterday, we had a really interesting debate and discussion on the CEPI 100-day mission. And I just wondered, um, you know, trying to get from sequence to vaccine, kind of what you think of the role of the DSMB and kind of the pressures you may face to do it in essentially a third of the time. So... I think that this would be absolutely crucial and critical for that, for this process, isn't it? Because it's the independent uh, body that actually has no vested interest, except, you know, in the sort of general sense, in the uh, success of a vaccine. What it's trying to do is to protect participants and ensure the integrity of the, of the trial. And, and certainly during the uh, um, uh, COVID-19 period, we were absolutely adamant, and that was the same in the the US, that that was our purpose. Our purpose was not to demonstrate the vaccine was uh, uh, effective. It was to maintain the safety and integrity of the trial. So I think DSMB has become more and more crucial with this additional uh, pressure. And I think it really comes back to the importance of chairing. So you need to have strong chairs who are able to say, both to the investigators, but also to the trial sponsors and, and indeed to, to industry, this is how it's going to happen, it, you know, if you want the DSMB to, you know, continue making uh, appropriate recommendations. Okay, then going down that line there, I think it's, uh, yes, you. So, Dennis from Denmark, I'm curious, you said that the, you also wanted more information directly down to the participants. So I can see some some issues with doing that. So So what, when and how? So, okay. So, I mean, clearly what you wouldn't want to do is to provide all of the sort of individualized, you know, trial information. I mean, obviously it's anonymized or or that that sort of thing. But I think to inform the trial participants that a safety committee is met and it's reviewed the trial data and it is recommended that the trial continues, I think is is, um, uh, more than a courtesy. I think, it, you know, it should be done in vaccine trials because that will reassure the trial participants that, you know, um, that, um, you know, their part, continued participants okay and actually really sh- probably will improve retention within trials as well. So I, I think it's the generality of information is important. I absolutely agree with you that you wouldn't want to give them any information that would lead them to actually try to predict what the vaccine was doing. But it's not. It's not the so I think generally, uh, if a trial is stopped uh, or indeed paused for a, uh, any length of time, the investigators will communicate with our participants in writing to explain what has happened. So that, I think that's, that's generally happened. Then we go down the line again. Uh, so in the slide, it was said that one of the participants could be a community member. So how do you, uh, is expression a multicentric study and how, how, how would you suggest selecting a community member for this? So, I mean, ideally, if it was a multi-centre study, you, you might have more than one uh, community uh, members. And, and um, this is something that's not very common. And so I'm not specifically recommending that all trials have a community member. But I think increasingly now, 
with the recognition that there needs to be um, uh, confidence in, in vaccines or any intervention from communities, having community members that actually reassure um, uh, people uh, the trial that these aren't just people with vested interests overseeing safety is important. So it, clearly you can't get complete representativeness, but I think having one or two lay members can be really uh, important. Okay, then we go down the line here. Yes. And so the question on um, when you recommend to your investigator to, to either pause or stop for, for safety or fix your facility, what kind of level of detail can you communicate to the investigator? Because they are still blinded, I presume. Can you provide, because they need to make the ultimate decision, but they don't have all the data. So I was wondering how that works. So when a trial is stopped, generally the investigator, or well, the recommendation is to stop. Generally, the investigator will then be unblinded, see the data and see, see that, you know, will, will agree with you. I mean, as I say, it would be extraordinarily unlikely for them to disagree with you. So it would be a recommendation to unblind and, 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 and see the data. When you hold a study, you have seen the unblinded data, but you don't have to communicate to the investigator why you're holding. You're just saying, we recommend that this is held and we would like more information. That's all you need to communicate. You certainly don't want to communicate what's been happening in the in the trial. Okay, uh, no one else on that line, so we take then the next line here. I think everybody's asking a question. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the question, I think it was related to a previous one. So if a trial is conducted in multiple countries, should the DSMMB have representation from experts from the local region or... So I think that's a really important thing to highlight. I don't think it's done well enough, certainly in the trials that we were involved in, which uh, involved participants in South Africa, in Brazil, uh, in Kenya and so forth. There were representatives from those countries. So um, uh, the chief investigator spent a, a lot of time trying to make sure that there was was representation. And oftentimes I think that was really useful, not in terms of under, for the DSMB understanding local context, but also for the regulatory authorities to have confidence that there was representation from their countries on, uh, um, uh, on the DSMB because it's, it's extraordinary how multinational trials bring out the nationalism of ethics committees and regulatory authorities. And so, you know, they say, well, you know, these are a bunch of people who don't understand our context, but actually this is what we want. But if there's somebody on the DSMB from their country, it reassures those regulatory authorities that things are being conducted appropriately and in the right context. So I think the point you make is essential. Okay. okay. Down the line, then we're going over there. Yes, you so is there, uh, this, I'm Rita from the U.S., is, is there a resource for willing and expert DSMB members that we can uh, consult? That would be really helpful. There is not. But what you're touching on is how do you accumulate the, the experience to become a DSMB member? And I've just, uh, in the last year, joined a DSMB actually for a, for a um, an erythromycin trial in uh, HIV-affected adults, not, not a, a vaccine trial where they're going to have interns on the DSMB, where people are able to participate in the DSMB uh, process and learn about it from more experienced DSMB members. So I think, I hope that increasingly that will be the pattern in DSMBs, that you have people who are earlier on in, in their career who will learn that process by joining DSMBs. Um, that does have, you know, particular complications in terms of indemnity and confidentiality and so forth, but I think those can be uh, surmounted. Yes. Thank you. Um, related to the transverse myelitis example, one of the information that was not on the slide, I think, or I missed it, is in which group the trial participant was, was, was placebo or, um, or vaccine. And that's obviously, I mean, that would play into your um, decision not to pause the trial or to pause the trial, right? And that you would know before having to convene a DSMB meeting, et cetera. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So you're right, there were sometimes adverse events where we decided not to, um, but quite often we would still want more detail because um, uh, um, that provided context for when other events occurred. Okay, coming down the line, this bench doesn't have any questions, you're all wise and fine. Oh, there's one question, yes. We're going bench by bench, I'll ask my question. I'm trying to make time. Um, are there examples that you have heard of where the DSMB has recommended a halt and it has not been taken up? Or is that, you know, in theory, it's not binding, but it's always taken up? 
So, as I mentioned, it's extraordinary. I'm, a, I'm aware of where there has been a, a more of a tussle than uh, you would expect, but I think that's extraordinarily rare, and I think over time that happens less, less and less. And I think it sort of goes back to very careful chairing by the chair as well to manage that process uh, um, effectively. I don't think um, uh, Kath Maitland will mind, but in the FEAST trial, the trial investigators were absolutely devastated. As you might imagine, they all sat around almost in tears because, you know, their trial was going to demonstrate how they were going to save critically ill children um, uh, uh, was based on a false premise. So, you know, you have to manage that situation extremely sensitively and carefully. And if I can ask a follow-up related to that chair comment you made, the, the last example you've had us um, vote on, does the chair recommend halting independent of the rest of the DSMB in a situation like that? Or was there a quick DSMB meeting and then... The chair so, recommended after a DSMB consult. A, a DSM, I mean, except in extraordinary circumstances, um, a DSMB chair should consult with his DSMB. That you know, there should be no. I mean, what you can do is have an agreement with the um, uh, principal investigator, or chief investigator, not to uh, um, administer the vaccine any further. You know, in the 24 hours it takes to set up a, um, a DSMB, but uh, it needs to be by consensus. Um, a DSMB's uh, um, sh- uh, chair should not be taking unilateral. You know, decisions and need to be able to consult with all members of the SMB if possible. Coming down the line, yes. Hi, Gonzalo from Argentina. I have a technical question. How do you receive the information usually? You have access to the electronic CRF or the clinical charts or only briefing from the sponsor or the PA? So the, the trial statisticians provide prepare the data. They will should provide summaries and the SMBs often have to educate the statisticians about what they want and how they want it summarized. Because as, as you might imagine, in big trials, you could then be inundated with everything. And particularly industry tends to sort of um, uh, uh, data dump you with every line event that's, that's occurred. And it's impossible to go through all of that effectively. And, and you can miss important signals. So we, we've, in distant I've been on, had some tussles with um, the investigators about how that data is summarized, but you do, but obviously you need to be able to see it for yourself. Um, hi, I'm Talia. I wanted to know about uh, long-term follow-up of safety signals, especially in a situation where you've decided to carry on with the trial. Is that your responsibility or is that somebody else's? So the DSMB's role is throughout, is for the trial participants alone, so not obviously when a vaccine is introduced, and for the length of the trial. So their, their responsibility stops at the end of the trial. And um, a post-licensure surveillance is really critical, although quite difficult to implement in, in many countries, particularly res, in resource-poor settings. Although there are big WHO moves to improve um, the surveillance for what will be rare adverse events. And certainly what happened during the COVID-19 vaccine trials is that some of the really rare events, you know, for example, the thrombotic phenomenon, only became obvious once the vaccine was um, introduced into routine use and enough numbers accumulated so that you started to see those events. So it's only within the trial participants, only within the trial. Now we're running out of time and uh, the director started, came to, to tell me that we should be stopping. If you have very, very burning questions. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, uh, the very last one here and then we need to hold and, and then uh, Rob, you are with us uh, so that you can ask your questions during the break. Uh, actually, it's not a question. It's uh, to underline uh, uh, an answer that uh, the professor provides to my colleague uh, regarding the, the quota of uh, the presence of local experts uh, within the, this uh, committee. So uh, if the local uh, government asks for the presence of this local, because it's not because they have their own ethic, because it's a, a way of recognizing the expertise of the local co- Committee and uh, also it's the way of uh, uh, considering them as local uh, experts. So I think it's important to underline it and to not say it's like extravagance from the um, local experts. No, I, 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 it's important I, to have I this kind crucial. of respect. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I think it's crucial because otherwise you're making decisions about populations that you're not part of. So I think, no, absolutely.